Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Intercom Culinary Kitchen. I'm Lynn Bramer from WXRT Chicago, your morning host. You can applaud. This is it's a convivial event. Uh, we are doing a cooking and wine demo with the luscious Tattinger Champagne today. How about a toast to Tattinger? And let me just say that when I celebrated my 25th anniversary at WXRT during the morning show, Tattinger brought me this smaller bottle of champagne to enjoy at the live broadcast. But our listeners being what they are, finished it before I think I even had a sip of it. But look at all the names signed on here. Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Paul McCartney. Okay, you can't see it. They're not really on there. They were not in there. But today we have two very special guests and two fellows that I've worked with in this kitchen before. First of all, standing in that corner, Ron Breitstein, certified specialist of wine. Let me tell you a little bit about Ron. He, he works for the co-brand um, uh, Fine Wine and Spirits Company. But this guy, he appears on CBS2 Chicago on television as their wine expert. When they say, we need a wine expert, go get Breitstein. We need him now, stat. Uh, he's the co-author of Wine and Dine, California Fine Wines, matched with uh, Gourmet Recipes. Uh, he also writes for a bunch of different magazines, Wine Spectator, I'm sure you've heard of that, Wine Enthusiast, Beverage Retailer. He's been working in the business for 30 years. It's a pleasure to have you here. How about a hand for Ron, who's going to help us out with a tantric champagne. And no wine and food pairing would be complete without food. <laughs> so we have, standing in this corner, in the center of the ring, Dan Harris from Crosby's Kitchen, and also from Ella Ellie. The guy is working so much, I don't know how he had time to come down here today. Dan, welcome Happy back. To here. Happy to be here. Thank you. And the good news for all of you is, unlike some cooking demonstrations we do here, you will get to enjoy three different Tattinger Champagnes, and three different courses of small bites here in the culinary kitchen. Woo! Right. Now, uh, if you want to tell your friends, you can find us on 93XRT's Facebook page. We are streaming this live, so we are all on XRT's Facebook, watched right now by literally dozens of people. <laughs> so I want all of you behaving as you usually do, which is on the verge of out of control. All right, we're starting with, of course, champagne, which I want to point out before our wine specialist, Ron, points out, champagne really goes with everything. Is there anything champagne doesn't go with? You know, I don't think there is anything it doesn't go with. It's, it's my favorite thing. I always like to start everything with bubbles and make everything a celebration. You know, if you're at a restaurant and you're not sure, they come over and say, uh, before, do you know what you want? You want a cocktail? Do you want wine? Before you get, you know, into the wine list or anything, the thing to do is get Tattinger Champagne all around. I think wherever you are. That's what I do. And, you know, if you're doing it at home, you know, maybe like my family, uh, you're a little dysfunctional when it comes to decorating the tree. And you keep putting it off and saying, well, we'll do it tomorrow, and then we'll do it tomorrow. But when you finally decorate your tree at home in the holiday season, open a bottle of Tattinger Champagne, you can get it at Jewel Osco, right? You can, definitely. And there's a Jewel Osco near where you live, I'm betting right now. So what are we starting with here? We are starting with uh, the Tattinger Brut Le Francais. It is a blend. So there's, let me take a step back. I went a little too far ahead of myself. This champagne doesn't have a vintage on it. We call it non-vintage. So when you buy a bottle of this Tattinger today, or three or four or five years from now, it should taste virtually the same. We call it a house style. So what we do is they, we blend two or three different vintages to make our non-vintage champagne. And this is a blend of three different grape varieties as well. There's 40% Chardonnay. Tattinger is known for using more Chardonnay than most any champagne house in the world. And then there's 35% Pinot Noir. And then there's 25% Pinot Meunier, which is a very not well-known grape variety, except in Champagne. By itself, it doesn't taste great. There's some people that have made some still wines out of it, but it's not that exciting by itself, but it's the perfect grape to blend in to Champagne to give it the body and viscosity that it needs to have all these flavors that uh, 
come out of it. So one of the things that I'm really big on when I, we do wine and food pairing is I always like to taste the wine first before we have any food. So before uh, we'll do this first before Dan uh, does his demo and then we'll serve the food. But I always like to you know, smell the wine, see what kind of fruit I smell in it. See what kind of aromas are in there. When it comes to champagne, champagne is gets because it sits on yeast. That's how it helps convert and get the CO2 into it to get so it becomes sparkling. Some some champagnes will have a very yeasty character to it, like maybe to smell like a little bit of brioche or bread character to it. I'm getting a little apple, a little pear, mm -hmm. and a little champagne. It, yeah. it's, <laughs> It's very champagne-y to me. They did it right. They, they did, did it, it right. right. They figured it out. And now, it, why? You said, you said you use a lot of Chardonnay. What is it about Chardonnay that Tattinger likes? Well, Chardonnay has a lot of acid in it. And so the acid brings brightness to the champagne. Pinot Noir is great, but Pinot Noir is going to bring you more fruit and a little bit less acid, more tannin. And we will have one that's more Pinot Noir in it a little bit later on. But on this one, this is for the house style. Uh, they make what they call their Tete de Cuvée, which is a Comte de Champagne, uh, which is 100% Chardonnay. Oh. And now, is a Blanc de Blanc 100% Chardonnay usually? In most cases, yes. Okay. I mean, you could probably have a small percentage of... Uh, Pinot Meunier. Correct. Pinot Meunier in it, yes. Yeah, when, when uh, Somalia comes over and says, well, this has this much... Uh, uh, um, Chardonnay and this, if you throw in, but does it have any Pinot Meunier? <laughs> They'll be very impressed. <laughs> as long as you say it better than I do, and then they'll just go, what is this person talking about? So please don't drink all that's in your glass so that you have some to try with the food, but Sorry. remember how it tastes in your mouth by itself, and then taste it when the food comes out, because the wine should taste differently in most cases after the food goes into your mouth, and in most cases, if we've done this right, and I'm pretty sure we have, uh, it'll taste even better. All oh. right. Dan so. Harris, you're popping corn over here. What's the movie for the night? <laughs> you know, you pop the champagne bottle, and it made me think of popcorn, and I just want to have fun. The whole idea behind this is the holidays and having fun. Um, so a little bit of where I was at with every pairing on here was going out to the grocery store and kind of taking something that you may not grab when you go out, which to me was popcorn kernels. I got these from Nichols Farm, actually, out in Marengo. Really? Um, one of the big things at Ella is we like to try and work with our local farmers as much as we can. That's something that has been big in the last few years, something I learned when I was out in New York and just kind of having that relationship with where the food comes from. So Marengo and Nichols Farm has been big. My entire career back home, we're certainly using them over at Ella. Um, super simple, just get the olive oil hot, about four or five minutes, and the, you'll get your kernels to start popping. Um, don't lift your <laughs> top off the, on the stove. You'll be having Wait, popcorn coming have everywhere. <laughs> Um, and then what we're going to do with this, we're going to try and do something a classic Italian, uh, cacio e pepe. So it means cheese and uh, pepper. And we have cacio e pepe pasta, which is the most classic version, typical Roman dish on the menu at Ella. Uh, we're doing a, an amuse with gnocco frito. So it's a fried dough for New Year's Eve for our tasting menu. And then this is just something fun that my mom made at home. Uh, she didn't know that she was doing it, but she was making cacio e pepe for the longest time. Uh, so this is just butter and cheese. I use medic or... Uh, Sorry, Szechuan peppercorns. Ooh, you smell nice. those. They add a little bit like floral tone to it to get the pepper mix kind of more, uh, more of a nose. And so as this starts to pop, yeah, we have peppercorns toasted in a little bit of olive oil and butter. So are those are the Szechuan peppercorns, and or, uh, just or regular Tella cherry peppercorns, both of them. So a little well, that, like the, 50, the Szechuan blend. is kind of an interesting twist on cacio de pepe. Yeah, I, I'm sure little, they're not doing that in Rome. No, definitely not. Eh, that's not entirely true. There's a couple of guys. I kind of I picked it up at one of the uh, one of the restaurants out there. They had a bunch of different Madagascar uh, pepper varietals, and I kind of brought that back home with me. As you can see, we have our popcorn popping. Hey, through. you're not supposed to lift that. <laughs> so, super simple. Toasting the peppercorns, really getting all those aromatics out, and then what we're going to do is, in place of salt, we're going to use a pecorino romano cheese, which is kind of the little brother, if you will, of Parmigiano Reggiano. Uh, sheep's milk, always sheep's milk, and it adds a tang, a nuttiness, and then that saltiness that you would get from just salting your popcorn. So it's all the flavors of buttery popcorn that you get at the movie theater, but with a little Italian flair to it. Movie theater should start offering the Dan Harris version of uh, Cacio de Pepe popcorn. Opening, I need to open a movie theater. 
Um, now, you worked at a couple of uh, acclaimed restaurants in New York before you came back home. I did. As the prodigal chef. Uh, James Beard uh, nominated restaurants, award-winning restaurants. What did you take away from that experience working in New York? It's the level of commitment to what you're doing. It's the details. It's everyone coming here and you can make food. Um, it's the people you surround yourself with and getting the best group of people in there that just want to work and are all working towards the same goal. This job's hard enough, so it's, it's about the people that you work with. And you have a good crew there at El Alley. You best crew. You've got rave reviews so far. Best crew I've worked with in a very long time. And you're open late on the weekends because I was just telling him that uh, this Friday I get to start my vacation. Here's to starting a vacation. <laughs> I'm sure many of you are. So I'm going to start by going to see It's a Wonderful Life at the Music Box Theater, their annual sing-along. It's a great thing to do. And, you know, it's just down the street from Ella Ellie. So I think after the movie, the thing to do, wouldn't you think, to go have a late supper at Ella Ellie? Yeah, Maybe we are. Uh, Harris will have, even be there. We were surprised that uh, they had, what is it, White Christmas this weekend at Music yeah. Box? And uh, yeah, we got a nice little pop from that that we weren't ready yeah, to see. Yeah, we, <laughs> we were there. We take 20 people every year to see White Christmas because we're insane. And uh, uh, people dress up in ugly Christmas sweaters and they bring jingle bells and they have a wonderful time. South and there is just down the time. street from you guys. That's what the whole South Park Corridor is about right now, it's just having a good time. It's a lovely little orange uh, cruzette. I got inspired last time I was here and saw your red one. I wanted to bring my, my little orange one. Pay tribute to my... There you go. It's all done? It's all done. It's, it's all ready nice. to go? Are you guys trying it? We're tasting. Yeah. How does Everyone's it taste? Nice good? Food. Are we allowed to taste it now? Can we try it now? Can't have enough cheese. Right? Oh. Mmm. <laughs> cheese never hurt the sipping of a Tattinger uh, champagne. Never. Ever. Wow. That's a great combination. Very interesting. Did you all get to try the champagne with it? Tastes different, doesn't it? Some of the kind of smoothed out a little bit for me. It got the kind of the length, got a little more length to it. I don't know what any of you might have tasted. Okay, so did you? Let's anybody see. want to tell me what they like different, better? Smoother. Smoother. Smoother yeah. Smoother. Is yeah. that fat from the cheese? The cheese kind of coats, and the cheese and the butter kind of coat the palate, and you kind of get that mm -hmm. nice long finish to the wine. Nicely done, Dan. Let me ask you a stupid question. Sometimes in a restaurant, I see somebody with champagne, and they pour the champagne, and they go like this, and my first impulse is, no, no, no. You're not supposed to stir up champagne, are you, like you do with wine, well, or do you? you know, depends on what kind of glass you have it in. A lot of times, we'll drink it traditionally in flutes. Right. Uh, tonight, we're having it in these glasses, and this allows you to smell the aromas a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, so you would swirl wine. it? You know, it's wine. It just happens to be wine with bubbles in it. it starts I'm, I'm worried wine. about I'm worried about harming the bubbles. I don't want the bubbles well, being hurt. The bubbles are tougher than you think, actually. Are they really? So, yes. It's not. You know, they don't disappear instantly. Well-made champagne. You know, one of the things with Tattinger Champagne is, by law, if you go to Champagne in France, you have to age a non-vintage Champagne for 16 months before you can release it. Tattinger ages theirs for a minimum of 36 months. Really? Yeah, so that's why you get this refinement, this richness, and it keeps the structure together better because it's had more time to meld. It's living in the bottle, and when you pop it open, you're letting it out, and it's... It's alive. Exactly. You know what? It, it, it's like angels dancing on your tongue. Um, now, this is lovely. But we have so many bottles to get to. I, I, I think, aren't we about ready to move on to our I our think next we're ready to move on to the next one. Scott, are we ready to move on to the next one? Okay. <laughs> He's having some popcorn, which is good. <laughs> Just snacking. Scott, another one of our wine specialists. Yes. A hand for Scott. He's, he's helping out here from Co-Brand. Now, as you know, I'm not an expert on very much of anything, uh, but that looks like a rosé to me, champagne. What gave it away? I don't know, the distinctive rosé sort of color to it. Right, well, this is Tattinger's Brut Prestige Rosé. Non-vintage as well, so it's two to three different vintages that are uh, blended together to make this wine so that 
you'll get the same basic flavor of, out of this each time. And this has got more Pinot Noir in it. I believe it's 50% Pinot Noir with Chardonnay and Pinot Meunier. A little Pinot Meunier, never hurt anybody. But Keep that in mind. What they do is that they take and you can make you can make, take white grape you can take red grapes and make a clear white champagne spark or sparkling wine out of it a blanc de noir. What they do here though is what they'll take a little bit of still pinot noir and when you finish a, a champagne and you take it off of the yeast cap, you put in what's called a dosage and it's usually some sugar water and uh, some to get to get a little sweetness because this can be pretty dry if you don't put that in. But what we also do with this is they put a little bit of still pinot noir in it. So not only do they use Pinot Noir grapes from the start, then they put some still Pinot Noir, which will give it more color. So that's really more of a coloring agent. Right. And it's, but it can, it's really interesting because it can change the whole brightness of the wine. Years ago, I was fortunate enough to go make my own sparkling wine at a winery in California. And we were sitting there playing with the dosage, and one milliliter of Pinot Noir made a dramatic difference in the way it, in the way it finished the wine and how really? it tasted. Really? Would never have thought that for all the years that I've been doing this, that like opened my eyes to something I would never would have thought of. One milliliter in the dosage, and you're you're only putting this much into the bottle to begin with. Uh -huh. So and it totally changed it. So these guys have this really down, so they know exactly what to do with it. So that this color is constantly the same with every bottle, and you can always open them with confidence, knowing that they're going to taste fantastic. Do we have some here? Oh, right behind us. Oh. oh. Look at this, right behind us. Gosh. I'll take the more full one. Please do. It's yeah. a miracle. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. To Tattinger. Happy Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? Happy Tuesday, everybody. And when you smell this, and I, you know, because it's in this glass, certainly swirl it a little bit, and you're going to get, I think, certainly very different aromas than we got in the Brut La Francaise. What, what should we be looking for in this bouquet? Well, I think you're going to smell a little more fruit in this one because the Pinot Noir is a little fruitier and there's a little more tannin to it, so the aromas will be a little bit stronger. I've always, champagne, some champagnes, I've always been able, I've been able to pull the aromas out of and others, I'll sit here and smell them for 10 minutes and I just don't get everything out of it sometimes. It's very interesting. I'm getting a little mm -hmm. strawberry. Um, yeah, a very pronounced champagne taste to it, as well as the. Is that all a factory champagne taste that comes through? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Mm. Now, when you uh. taste it, though, the bubbles dance on your tongue differently with this wine than in the first one. More like angels tap dancing than just. I, dancing. I believe that's yeah, that's a good way to put it. And this is a true story, way back thirty years ago when I started working in the wine industry. My family had a retail wine and spirit store in California. And this has always been my favorite rosé long before I worked for the company that's, that represents it. So um, it's, one of, it's a treat and I'm just, I'm thrilled. It, I, I'm thrilled to get to drink this when I drink it because it's just so delicious. And it reminds me, it tastes about the same as it always has. And mm -hmm. I think that's a sign of, uh, of quality when you can have a product that tastes the same 30 years ago as it does today almost, so. Well, I mean, Tattinger is, is a beloved brand, and uh, we're talking about how champagne goes with different things, but there are subtle differences in, in the dishes and in the champagnes we're, we're having, and now Dan Harris gets to step forward with what looks like a lovely piece of fish. So back to kind of where the roots were in New York, uh, back at Esca, we learned about Italian crudo, our Italian sushi, so that was kind of a big thing when I was out there about 10, 12 years ago, it started getting going. Uh, Dave Pasternak is the master of it, and while it's simply about the fish, um, I really do like the time to take the little ingredient, like little seasonal ingredients, and add them to make the entire dish kind of pop and stand out. So we're doing Mediterranean sea bass today, and then these are not weird-looking tomatoes; they're persimmon. Wow! It's citrus season, so we're doing persimmons, blood orange, um, a little bit of Kalamata olives, and then some local microgreens. So I don't think it's something you should be scared to do at home. Uh, if you have a great fishmonger, if you go to a great grocery store and get fresh product, you can have raw fish and not have a problem with it. Uh, the easiest thing is get a nice clean filet, pop it in the freezer for a little bit just to kind of get that chilled right down to 32 degrees, and you're going to kill any bacteria that you might want to be worried about. Really? Um, is that have, what does it? Yeah, it's just getting it underneath 32 degrees. You don't have any bacteria growing at that point, and 
it's totally safe and easy to uh, do at home. I didn't so, know that. That's great to know. Super, super simple. Sushi for everybody at home. I'm telling you, they do all the sushi lessons at all the, at any sort of top and everything else. It's something you can do at home very, very easily. So another th big thing is doing uh, cutting against the grain like you would a steak. You're going to get nice, softer pieces of fish. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to kind of have some fun and play this. Now, where did you get the idea to work with persimmon? The persimmon is not something I see on a lot of menus. Do you people see persimmon a lot? Persimmon yeah. is, it's season. It's like a six week treat that we get right around now, just like cherries. Cherries is my favorite season of the year, but that season closed a long time ago. And now we're into persimmons right in the middle of uh, citrus season. So these are coming from California and uh, all the way up to Washington. And then you'll find them at any grocery store. They're kind of like the star fruit you look at you. I don't know what the hell to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can, Unless you can, you're Dan Harris. You can just peel them and eat them. They have like a sweet kind of botanical flavor to them. Um, I'm obsessed with having like shapes and changing kind of how things look in presentation. So we take a little apple core and punched them out and then marinated these little shotgun shells with uh, lime juice and honey. Ooh. And that's what we have here, dressed in like little coins. I kept giving to people at the restaurant and they're like, oh my God, that's a great tasting carrot. <laughs> <laughs> It's yes, it is. I grew it in my backyard. Uh, a little blood orange juice, because why not? Oh, it looks beautiful, too. That's great. Uh, biggest portion of this is seasoning. So a little bit of sea salt. Everyone should have some at their house. A little goes a long way. And then splurge for your holiday season on good olive oil. Uh, this is one of the best times of the year to buy olive oil. Grapes get picked the same time all the olives get picked. So getting fresh pressed olive oil is a treat. And it's just fruitier and grassier instead of that kind of like sharp, bitter, astringent olive oil I think a lot of Americans are used to. Just getting this nice, bright, vibrant, grassy olive oil is awesome. Now, I've noticed every chef I've ever known puts their, f they put your finger on top of it. I don't know why. You know? <laughs> well, it. I'm glad you're all here. We don't know why. It doesn't uh, control the speed it came out well, at. It just made I, it look cool. That's the important thing. It looks cool. If you're a chef working in a high pressure kitchen, if you're not occasionally trying to do something because it looks cool, yeah, why even bother? More Nichols Farm here. We have some red mustard greens uh, and wasabi arugula. So it's gonna be a little extra spicy. So what is the wasabi, the spicy? Sometimes you gotta worry about that when you're pairing a wine. What, what does that do with the champagne? Well, if you have enough fruit and widely fruit in the champagne, it should cut nicely through the, the spicy or in a little bit of sweetness in the, in the champagne. But That's usually awesome. it tends to work very well, especially when there's, you know, the tannins in it with this rosé. Take a look at this. The last time I saw a color combination this beautiful, it was a Juan Moreau at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And it was simple. That wasn't hard. Have you made fun. it look simple. Have fun with it. Take a chance. Um, I didn't quite catch you got You got the plugs of persimmon. And you said it was honey. And a little, like a touch of honey because they're already sweet. So every day that goes by, like these come in, they'll, they'll be rock hard. If you're buying one, you want to buy a rock hard persimmon because in a day and a half, it'll ripen up. It'll start to get soft and all of the sweetness, like concentrated sugar will come out of it. So just a touch of honey to kind of balance, um, to bring out that sugar and then fresh lime juice. They actually use the lime cordial that we use in our, uh, co our cocktails at the restaurant. So uh -huh. it has lime zest and sugar and lemon zest and fresh lime juice. And it just has like a really beautiful, almost simple syrup, but it's still citrusy. Beautiful. Um, and what's the best way to eat these? With, with a your, fork or with spoon? Your finger? Your finger? <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to seem like a, a savage. fork over there. I, I don't want to be a barb. Oh, you know what? I've worked you're here right, before. You're right over there. I, I'm, right in here. I've worked here before. There is a utensil drawer. These are my favorite utensils. In the Intercom Culinary Kitchen. <laughs> we are streaming on Facebook Live. I hope you're watching out there on Facebook and going, what the heck are they doing? We're enjoying gourmet food with Chef Dan Harris. We're enjoying Tattinger Champagne of all sorts with Ron Breitstein, who is our wine specialist today. Okay. Who wants to go first? I will, I will. You go first. Mm. I'm not sure you're going to like that. Just pass it forward. <laughs> if you don't care for it, yes. Um, we'll take care of here. You can have your I own have fork. Go, I can get my own fork. You know what's okay, nice, cool. Dan, is that uh, the flavor profile has a really nice twist with that uh, olive. Is that a Kalamata? Yes. Kalamata olive. It brings a little bit of brine back into it. Get to, like, a little again, brine. Bring the saltiness, make it taste like the ocean a little bit. 
It's really good, isn't it? It's really good. What do you folks think? You're not getting any because I, I don't, I'm not sure you behaved. You did not behave, so. No, it's coming. We're getting it all. Tell me this, Ron. Have you ever yes. sabered a bottle of champagne? I haven't. I am. Um, have you? No, I was given a saber in California recently as if I was going to saber champagne, but I didn't. They, I don't think they wanted me playing with the sword. You all know what sabering is. You get an actual big metal saber. And here I am explaining how to do it. And just between you and me, I don't know how. But <laughs> it's something like this. You take the saber and you slide it down the length of the bottle. And you gotta you have, have it. You, you have gotta to find have, the crease. You have to find the crease. You have to have the cork. The, Apparently the there's some the, details I overlooked. <laughs> <laughs> the foil in the cage need to kind of come off. And then you have to find the seam and hit it right on the spot. And you know, I'm, you take I'm, the cage off before yes. you. Yeah, you, know, you have to take the. Oh cage my off. God, yeah. it's so good. I'm talking to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't I, tried it. I'm just a couple bad party egg trick. away from being somebody else going. You know what? They were showing me how to saber a bottle of champagne. And I can do it for you right now. Where's your saber? Well, um, I bet. Let me ask you a question here. Yeah. So you've opened up a bottle or two of champagne. Yes. I haven't sabered one because I don't want to injure anybody. That's so, true. So, but no do, you, do you know do you know the question the answer to the question when you take the foil off and you untwist the cage how many twists you need to make on the cage to get it to come off to get the little wire cage yes do you know how many twists to untwist it it's the Three. same on every bottle of champagne that is incorrect Two. does anybody know the number amount seven seven is not correct six. it's not five six. what did you say six. yeah you are correct it's six six it's always six it's always six. So, always six. Always six. How many champagnes you've had? I have a so friend. So next time who, you open you when you open your champagne for New Year's Eve next week, uh huh. You're, when you open your Tattinger, count one, two, three, four, five, six, and then it'll be ready to separate and take off the cage. And then you get out the saber you have under the workbench <laughs> that you keep for for when you're role playing and you're the pirate. Uh, and uh, I'm getting too personal here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm projecting a little bit, and and then make sure you don't let anybody savor the champagne because it's just going to be a mess some, well, somewhere along the line. In fact, um, this is an interesting story about sharp objects. When uh, the Cubs opened up their uh, park at Wrigley, you know, outside the park, they have that nice. They had a, a ribbon cutting ceremony, and they invited me to participate. And they gave everybody who was cutting this, the the ribbon these cartoonishly big scissors. They, I mean, they were this big. Because it was a big ribbon, you know, but still it was like this. And I got to keep the ceremonial, my ceremonial giant scissors, which was really cool. But I get home and my wife is outside and a neighbor's there and I got these giant, these just huge scissors. I'm going, look at this, look how cool this is. And my wife walks there, give me those. I felt like I was six years old again. <laughs> Don't let Lynn play with the giant scissors. Were they that's, pointy at the end? Is that why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's why. They were pointy at the end. Okay, is, is everybody, you guys demolished the second course, so, didn't you? how did you like how the rosé tasted with this? I thought it was great. So, I mean, we did give Dan these champagnes ahead of time so he could get the right uh, pairings with them, but we always want to hear what everybody has to think about it. Everybody's tastes are a little bit different, but I think it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, I do too. Dan, I just want to know, did you do a lot of in-depth research of drinking the champagne before you decided on the courses? Um, or did you just take just like one sip and go, okay, I got it, I'm done, I'm ready to go? Or did you say, a couple more bottles, bring them in here? <laughs> I tasted a lot, I wrote down a bunch of no like just words all over the place, and then it took me like two weeks to go back to it and find time to be like, okay, never mind, I have to figure out what, the, what we're gonna do with all these ideas they haven't played, but that's how so we were actually auditions, writing, just like down, writing words all over you were, the place. That's how Sylvia Plath used to write poetry. I'm not with the champagne, I'm of course. I'm not Sylvia Plath. Yeah. Well, this no, is, you this are is, not. This is poetry in a bottle, I mean, come on there. It sure is. This is um, this is more romantic poetry in a bottle. True. I think this is more Percy Bysshe Shelley than, okay. say, Allen Ginsberg. Okay, uh, fair. You should join my trivia team. We need a person like you for this English poetry <laughs> stuff. You know, it's, do you do uh, the bar trivia? We do. And your team's pretty good? We try. Somebody invited me to one of those trivia bars. Some of you have done the trivia at, at bars. They brought me along to be the ringer for music. I said, oh, Lynn's going to know everything. And I explained, no, at the trivia contest, they're going to ask questions about Katy Perry 
and about Eminem, and sure enough, they're going, the first top five single from Eminem, and everybody looks at me like, I don't know. <laughs> when was the last time you heard Eminem and XRT? <laughs> so just another example of how, essentially, waste of time. <laughs> um, all right, if they finished, do we get a, do we get a third course today? We get, we get more. We, we get, get a third champagne, more. too. Okay. Tattinger Champagne, we've had the rosé, we've had the Francaise, we had the Prestige rosé. What are we moving okay. to now? We are moving to one the of my pretty favorites. Bottle? It's a pretty bottle. If we could turn all the lights on, no, we can't do that. Um, <laughs> this is called, the next one where you're going to be poured right now is called Nocturne. And if you take this in a dark room or have a little uh, blue light, it'll look like it's City Lights is what it's called. Really? Yes. Can know. we tur turn out the lights so we can see? I don't know if that'll work. This, turning out the lights may be more technical expertise than I have. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you had said put the needle on the turntable and back it up a quarter spin, I go, I got it, but I'm going to slip cue it. So this wine, this Tattinger Champagne Nocturne, is kind of, they call it Nocturne because it's kind of for after dinner, nighttime. We use it in a lot, it goes, does well, very well in nightclubs. It's a little bit sweet. It's the same blend as the Brut La Francaise that you had the first one, but the sugar is about four times as high on the dosage that goes back into it. So not overly cloyingly sweet, but has a nice sweetness to it. And I think we actually have some here, Lynn. Now, is, is this a champagne that could also double as something you'd have with dessert? Well, that's exactly, with dessert or as an aperitif. It uh -huh. could be either. Um, I'm just going to see if how well it goes with the uh, crudo, because there's some crudo well. rock. But when you smell this when you get it, as uh, they're coming around pouring it. Uh, we would call this a, a sec. Yeah. It's completely mm -hmm. sec. <laughs> this is so sec, it doesn't know how sec it is. So, and you can taste, I mean, you can smell the fruit in it. I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah, you guys just behave back there. You understand that my job for 25 years as a morning disc jockey is to read people's minds each and every morning. And let me just say, it's disgusting. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Well, I love this. Now, for every one of you that's going to say I don't like sweet wine, probably never had sweet wine like this. Because that's what I've always yeah, found is, I would over the years I've stood at tastings, pouring sweet wine in wine shops, and people say, oh, I don't like sweet wine, and I give them a little piece of chocolate with it. They try it, oh wow, I'll take two bottles. <laughs> um, oh, I grew up drinking sweet wine. My family served me lots of good German Rieslings when I was growing up, and I like sweet wines, and if they're made properly and balanced properly, you know, unless you don't like any dessert, and you don't like candy, and you don't like chocolate, you like sweet. But if you're going to drink, you know, when we were in college and we drank cold duck and that was bad sweet or, you know, things like that. I don't know why he's looking at me. I only drank the best possible uh, Boone's Farm. <laughs> uh, uh, I got a lot of apple from the bouquet of the Boone's Farm. Um, what were some other kind of Matus? Do you remember Matus? Yes. Blue Nun Riesling? Blue Nun, that was a little on the sweet Andy side. Green Springs, you drank that probably? Uh, I did not, <laughs> what do you take me for? No, <laughs> no. I never drank any Green Springs. <laughs> now, what, what's, the, I, I may have missed it, or maybe you didn't tell us, what, what is it's the great? It's, it's, it's the same, it's the same as the first one, is the oh. La France Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. So there is, thank God, a little Pinot Meunier. Right. Yes, definitely. Okay, good. So, but. You know, this has the, you know, the intensity of this is different than the previous two. And I love the sweetness in it, but it's not, you know, like going, oh my God, it's going to, you know, give me a sugar high or anything like that instantly. So, and it's, it's, but don't get them wrong. You might get another kind of high, if not a sugar high, because yes. it is champagne after all. Right. And it, it fills your head with uh, creative, imaginative thoughts you never thought possible before you walked in here tonight. <laughs> um, now so, this looks like you really, your, your mind really worked overtime to say, okay, we've got the nocturne. 
We are now taking people to a new strange place where it's late at night. It's after dinner. It's one o'clock in the morning. Here you are. You think you're at the culinary kitchen, but you're not. You're at some beautiful bistro at one o'clock in the morning. And what are they serving us, Dan, uh, at this hour? Uh, it looks like a little raclette to me. It does. It is raclette. It is Switzerland's best grilled cheese cheese in the whole wide world. Um, so good. yeah, instead of going the dessert route, because I, they don't really. I don't always go down that uh, the chocolate and the the bougie dessert I'm with route. You. I want to have a nice little savory, um, nutty something that the sweetness kind of pairs with and jumps around with. So we have the raclette, and then we also have a little uh, Calabrian chili tapenade. So it's going to have like spicy. It's going to have savory, but it's also going to be totally washed out by the wine. There's going to have a like nice little melody. What is in your tapenade there? So we have shallots. Yeah. Garlic confit. Oh, I whoa, whoa, mm. you don't just go blazing by garlic confit, <laughs> okay, because that sounds interesting to me. How do you make the garlic confit? Super simple. Just put garlic, uh, whole garlic cloves, a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of uh, canola oil, and uh -huh. then just bring it up nice and slow. You never want to see any browning. You just want to see like the slow kind of lazy bubbles coming out of there. Your whole house will smell like garlic. And so you're kind of roasting it. You're just it getting soft. it soft, and you're getting all the aromatics out of it. And okay. then you have you have two byproducts of that you have this great garlic that's nice and soft, and it's not kind of as sharp as raw garlic. But you also have this oil that you can use to make dressings and um, you know dual com purpose compound butters to put in your steak, stuff like that. So you have a bunch of different. You have a hundred percent yield on things that now taste like nice soft roasted toasty garlic. Okay, what else was in here? And then uh, we have the Calabrian chilies. shallots. Shallots. Um, Calabrian parsley, chili. Parsley, chive, a little bit of olive oil, and that's it. Woo! So, now when speaking I was, of walking around at 1 o'clock in the morning, I was at the Chris Kindle market and saw like the two-hour line to get a thing of raclette cheese, and I was like, what the hell are they doing? <laughs> they could just come to the Entercom Culinary Kitchen, sit down with like a dozen or so wonderful people, and have raclette made by Dan Harris right here. Now, was, when I was on Not the working. Swiss Olympic ski team, Back in 68, I didn't win the gold, only a bronze medal. But after, you know, the training sessions, we'd always sit down to some nice late night raclette. Now, I wish I had the Nocturne Tattinger with me at the time, because I think it would have gone nicely. It would have. You guys all have moment. this so far, the, the Nocturne? Have you been transported to one o'clock in the morning in a, no, I haven't. a little nocturnal bistro? Mm. So what you're what you're doing here. here? What are you doing? Trying to start the place on fire. Okay, here's some technical difficulties. Just ignore the overwhelming smell of gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. Let me just take. Oh, look at it! Is that a special raclette tool? You it have? is not. It is a, a dual purpose. Cut the fish knife, wash it off, and then scrape the <laughs> back of it to <laughs> scrape the raclette cheese. So normally you'd take a nice torch and get this all super ooey gooey on the top, but it all comes off. Uh, all you have to do is bake it in the oven and you get this nutty, super creamy. It has like the consistency of mozzarella and fontina with the flavor of Swiss cheese. So it's kind of all the different flavor profiles you could want. Uh, and then to take that and get through the richness of the cheese, we have a little bit of, let me steal a spoon from there. Yeah, Love here, drawer. let me help you. Don't say I didn't help out Chef Dan <laughs> Harris today. So, nice little tang. Uh, Calabrian chilies are more salty than they are spicy. They're this special chili only grown in Calabria. There's just tons of farms made for them. They've been this big export for the last 10 years. Um, and the big thing that's cool about them is You'll get like one out of every hundred of them they'll actually get some serious spice to it but for the most part they impart this smoky um, almost salty flavor which is great so it's the classic chili pepper russian roulette yeah it's a great game have you played that game uh no i play real russian roulette mm. <laughs> you're obviously good at it <laughs> check one off for the chef <laughs> Mow! Okay. Am I allowed to try this now? You are. Simple. Keeping it simple for everybody. Put the champagne. Don't do a lot of work. Impress your friends. Mmm. Yeah. 
Have you ever done this raclette at uh, Hello Alley? It's coming on next week. <laughs> coming on next week? It is. So, you guys I'm are in the pipeline. I'm just your guinea pig today, aren't I? And the nice thing is at the restaurant, we have a nice little salamander, so I can just hold it underneath there. I don't have to turn the gas on and uh, try to set us all on fire. He's not talking about lizards. I don't want to get people upset that he's cooking lizards. It's, a, it's the like cheese a melter. broiler. It's a, yeah, it's a broiler. It's a heat from the top, not nearly as hot, but it gets a nice little... Gets the whole burnt cheese effect on the top of it. It's like Swiss Saganaki. I Saganaki. need one of those at home. You should. You should have one right in here in there. We should have one in. Dina, what? No salamander uh, heater above the stove? You gotta say what? Opa. Well, yeah, if it were, if we were on uh, Halstead in Greektown, yeah, set it on fire. Mm. I'm taking a snack. Yeah. You've, You've been working. Hard. You've been working. Some? No. When people go to Jewel Osco and they pick out whatever champagne they want, and I don't think you can go wrong with any of these for these dishes. Some may pair better with others. Mm -hmm. But as I said, my experience with champagne is it's one of the more universal uh, wine and spirits that you can come across in the world. But what would you say is the most uh, popular? Well, the most popular is the Brut La France. That's the one that's easiest to drink. Some people get affected by the color when they see the rosé and they don't care for it. Personally, um, if you find when you go to champagne houses, usually the most expensive champagne in a champagne house is their, what they call their tete de cuvee, the best of house, the rosé. Is it really? Yeah, so usually the rosé, like Tattinger's top rosé sells for probably around $250 a bottle where the Blanc de Blanc this 100 cent Chardonnay Tete Cuvée sells for about $160, $170 a bottle. And you'll find that in any champagne houses, they make less of it, and that's usually what the owners of the champagne houses like drinking. That's so interesting. Now, I understand why Merlot took um, a big dive in popularity. It was because of the stupid, well, it was a great movie, Sideways, but Paul Giamatti yelling, no bleeping Merlot, changed the whole profile for retailers around the country going, yeah, I'm not getting Merlot. Paul Giamatti doesn't like it. Well, the wine he had at the end, the Cheval Blanc. Yes. It's half Merlot. See, right there. <laughs> I, but it was a white wine, right? No, it was red. It was half Cabernet Franc, half Merlot, Ch Chateau Cheval Blanc. But he ate it with a with a burger in a fast food joint. Sometimes that's what you just have to do. You got you just got to do that. Yeah. But why does you know? In my mind, I think the public has kind of a perception of rosé is like, I don't want to go there. I know it's well, supposed to be good. Why is that? Well, up until about two years ago, that's how the public perception of this country was. Now, basically since early 2016, rosés are hot as can be, still rosés, sparkling rosés, cava that's rosé, you can't call Prosecco rosé by law, but it's, right. you know, anything that's pink that tastes good because people finally figured out that they're not all sweet that most of them are dry. But when people started drinking wine in this country, when it really started getting going in the early 70s, you'd go in and you'd find pink champagne would be on the shelf for $2.99 a bottle, and it was full of sugar. And that's what they tried, and they didn't like it because it didn't taste very good, to be perfectly honest. So people didn't drink it because affording that $12 or $14 bottle of champagne that was rosé was very cost prohibitive in the right. early, late 60s, early 70s. So now we're starting to see wines more universally accepted, more people are drinking wine, the millennials are drinking wine they're, as their first beverage of choice as opposed to spirits or as opposed to beer, and they're trying all sorts of different things and they're telling their friends, hey, this is good. We can drink this with any kind of food. It tastes good. It doesn't, it's not hard to drink. It, you know, you drink red wine sometimes when you start out. It can be very tannic and bold and tough to drink. Chardonnay, sometimes it's too dry or too acidic. But rosés kind of hit you right down the middle there and can be pleasing for almost anybody. You know, you work so much in the marketplace and see so many trends. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, are millennials drinking better quality wine? Because I know the baby boomers grew up drinking crap. <laughs> Yeah. Not only are the millennials drinking wine, they're drinking better wine, but they don't drink the same thing regularly. Uh -huh. They move around and try different things all the time. But they're not drinking 
$4.99 bottles of wine. They're drinking $9.99, $12.99, $15.99, $19.99 .99 bottles of wine. And you can get really good bottles of wine in those price ranges right. when you're st first starting to drink. I'll never forget, I was at a party with some family friends a couple, a few years ago, and their daughter was there. It was 23 years old, and she's, oh, we drink Pinot Grigio all the time. You know, she just got out of college, and I'm like, oh, when I was in college, nobody, you know, if anybody knew anything about wine, it was like a miracle. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, let me tell you, what doesn't taste good, my friend Harvey had a party in 1979, invited us over and had sheets of paper for a wine taste, but it was called the Wine Taste 250, and nobody could bring a bottle of wine that cost more than $2.50. <laughs> And, you know, we'd go from wine to wine to wine and write down our comments on it. And let me tell you, there wasn't a single bottle of $2.50 wine that was really very good. Uh, a lot of it had kind of a petroleum aftertaste, uh, I think. Um, and my friend Bill brought two bottles of wine that were $1 a piece. And as the night went on, I noticed that Bill's... Uh, writing became more and more flowery and more. So when he got to the one dollar bottle of wine, he wrote about it like it was Adonis, <laughs> like the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. And that's the dangers of wine, ladies and gentlemen. You have to keep your critical faculties even when you're drinking good wine. If only in 1979 I had found Tattinger's, my life would have been better. And so would Bill's, I think. You know, things well, thank would have God worked. you found it now and that you can uh, Make sure that the rest is always it. Yep. Well, how's everybody doing? Did you enjoy your three courses here and your champagne? We love doing this. How about a hand for uh, Ron here, our wine specialist? Thank you. And for Dan. Remember, you do not have to tour the world looking for a bottle of champagne. You can get a top flight bottle of champagne Tattinger, any one of these Tattingers at Jewel Osco, and I think there's a Jewel Osco near you. And maybe I'll see you, maybe I'll see you Friday night at uh, Ella Ellie for the start of our vacations. Because it's... Cor Cornelia and Southport, so just a uh, half door in on Cornelia, uh, half door east on Cornelia. Yeah. So um, they're open late on the weekends. Uh, make a reservation if you can. And uh, tell them you're a personal friend of Dan Harris. Probably won't get your reservation, <laughs> but they'll be impressed that somebody knows his name. That's right. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Lynn Bramer. Thanks to our chef and our wine specialist. Thanks to Tatger and Cobrand. And thank you to the Entercom Culinary Kitchen for letting us stay here late into the evening so that we could enjoy this nocturne at 1 a.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.